We are uh, in Parashat uh, Matot, in Masai, in Israel, and we're in Masai, in the diaspora in Matot Masai, and this is where Israel and the diaspora will finally meet after a few months of uh, being uh, Israel being ahead of the diaspora. So we're going to be uh, reading this week here in Israel, Masai, and outside of Israel, both Matot and Masai, and by that we're concluding the book of the Bamidbar. And uh, going into the next and final book. So today I want to talk about a very important uh, topic. And I'm going to start by asking you all a question. You don't have to answer, by the way. Uh, you can answer quietly to yourself. But it's a question that you have to carry with yourself. And hopefully today we'll be able to answer it. The question you want to ask yourself is, do you take opportunities or do you jump on an opportunity when it comes to you? Most people don't. Most people, it takes them by surprise and the opportunity passes and they don't take, uh, 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 they don't char jump on the opportunity. So you want to ask yourself the question, when an opportunity comes, do you actually jump on it and do you take advantage of that? And with that, I want to start with a short story about a certain individual who was a soldier here in Israel, uh, came from a very poor family, uh, lived in Yerushalayim, and uh, we're going a few uh, decades back, it was uh, very hard times in Israel, they didn't have much what to eat. They went uh, on Friday, him and his mother, to the shuk, to the market, and happened to be that this market was to sell uh, everything in wholesale, not to sell public, uh, privately or in, uh, in uh, retail, and like uh, to sell to, to private people. So his mother went to some, uh, one of the stores there and she takes two cans of tuna and she tells, how much for, she tells the person there how much for these two cans. And the person with a rough Israeli attitude screams at her, why are you bothering me? I'm selling here wholesale. This is not for two cans of tuna. I sell boxes here. Why are you even bothering me for two cans of tuna? Of course, she gets uh, offended. And her son, who was there, also got very offended, the soldier. And got it like, listen, all we have, what did we ask? We're asking to buy a can, two cans of tuna. <laughs> Times are hard. Don't have much money. And uh, luckily, this young individual, instead of reacting out of frustration, anger from being hurt and insulted, he jumped on the opportunity and he says, Ah, oh, you know what? He or anybody else here, they don't sell to private people. It's all wholesale. I think I'm going to open a store here in the market to sell to private people in wholesale prices. What an idea. And sure, that's what he did. He rented a 40 meter store and started selling uh, to private, to like personal people in wholesale prices. Now this person is one of the most richest person in Israel, owns most of the food uh, stores distribution here in Israel. His name is Rami Levy. Okay, for the ones who live in Israel, they know who we are. He has his stores everywhere. One of the most biggest uh, food pr product uh, services here in Israel. And what do you take from this uh, quick story? Why did he become so successful? Because he grabbed an opportunity. Instead of losing his temper and instead of being upset and insulted and so forth and getting upset at the person, he says, wait a minute, this is an opportunity. And instead of being insulted, he, as they say, took this point to, as they say, a moment of, of, of insult. He took it to a growth, to a place that everybody would want to take it. Psh. So with that, we can uh, kind of conclude by saying, you know, everybody wants to be successful. I don't know anybody who, if you ask them, do you want to be successful? No, no, I want to be a great failure in my life. Nobody has this uh, attitude, whether it's in business, whether it's in with your relationships, whether it's in with your studies, whatever you do. I don't know anybody that opens a business and says, I want this business to go down. I want to be bankrupt. 
And it's not only in business, it's in anything. You go and learn something, it doesn't matter what it is, whether it's to, to get a diploma or to just for the, for the education or the knowledge, you have a, a, a relationships. We all want to be successful. Of course comes the big question, what is the definition of success? Some people, if you tell them, what's, what's the definition for you to be successful? To make a lot of money. That's the definition of a certain individual. Another individual asks him, well, how do you define success? He's saying married to my wife with all the difficulties that we have. That's success. Or having my kids go in the path that I go, go on. That's for me is success. So, of course, you can measure success in many different ways. But really, the broad definition is that you fulfill your dreams. You dream about building a business, building a house, building a home, whatever. That's your dream. And how do you measure your success? That it actually came to fruition. Okay. Interestingly, usually I don't quote any other people but Torah scholars, but it happens to be that I want to quote today a certain individual, you sure have heard of him, Churchill, who says, what's the rule of success in life? That you can go from failure to failure and not lose your excitement and enthusiasm for the next thing that you're turning to. You don't have to be a Torah scholar to, be, to have a good approach to life. But that's really the, the way you need to look at it. Is that you want to have success. And how would you measure your success? Then we're going to address this today. How do you me measure, really measure the success? And... And, and going to the approach of uh, Churchill, why is that considered success? Why is for him going from failure to failure and without you losing your excitement and enthusiasm, why is that considered success? Why? Because only successful people can do it. You cannot be not successful and go from failure to failure. Most people, they reach the first failure and they stop. Most people, for them, failure is, this is where I stop. I don't continue. Who are the ones who continue? The successful ones. Because they don't get overwhelmed or disappointed from the failure. So, okay, we move on. So the successful people are the ones who don't stop even when they fail. Because most people, their definition of failure is, this is the point we're stopping. Okay. Now... If you want to define what's failure, because to most people, this has, everything has to come with definition. I told you, success, what is the definition of success? Is some people money, some people relationship. What is the definition of failure? That, from, that you can do it. If a person reached any type of failure, the business didn't work out, the dating with this individual didn't work out, the, the whatever I wanted to do, a diet, it didn't work out. What's the failure means? You can't do it. Give up. You move on. You, this is not for you. And that's most people, by the way. Okay. So today we want to try to address, A, what is the Torah approach to failure? Because in, in our life, most of us will fail not once and not twice, and in many cases, many times. So we want to see what's the approach with the Torah. How is the Torah holding by when I have failure? And not only that, why is Hashem letting me fail? I mean, wouldn't Hashem, the great God, merciful God, loves us all, why would He want me to fail? I mean, God is like our Father, so I don't want my kids to fail. I don't make my kids fail. I do whatever I can to make my kids not fail. So why would Hashem want me to fail? if you're looking at it more in a godly perspective. Not only that, in many cases you can say that why would Hashem cause me to fail? I mean, there's not once and not twice encounters that we find that Hashem wants us to fail, or we see in the Torah, in the Tanakh, that Hashem caused us to fail. So, how, how do we take that? And, most important, since most of us deal with different failures, is how do you turn the failure into success? Because, listen, not everybody necessarily went on a business venture and the business failed. Some people, for them, if their kids are not how they wanted them to be, that, they consider that failure. I failed with educating my kids. The marriage didn't work out, I failed with my relationship. Uh, whatever it is, 
And again, I'm not going to give you too many examples because every person has to do their own introspection. Where do I feel a failure? Where did I succeed? Where did I didn't? But many of people, when they fail, that, that affects them in a very negative way. So, first of all, if we look at the history, and we'll focus right now on the Jewish history, we can see something that is going to help us understand what we're trying to address today, is that many great leaders on the surface looked very successful, and if we look at their life, it seems extremely successful. And chas v'shalom are not taking the success from them. But when you really zoom into their life, their life wasn't life of glory. Or it didn't seem successful while they were living their life. Like take example, King David. King David, the whole world is, uh, is stunned and adores King David. Jews and non-Jews. You think while he was alive, he seemed like he was successful? No, he wasn't. Looking back, with what he achieved, we said he was a very successful individual. But as he lived his life, he didn't look like a successful life. You know, don't go so far. Go back to our forefather, Yaakov. Look at his life. Doesn't look like a successful life. He's thrown out of his house. He's, uh, 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 I can't even say, uh, works for his father-in-law. His father-in-law is like making a shmata out of him 20 years. He doesn't look like there's no, so much success there. But anyways, we're not going to start analyzing each individual. I want to focus on a certain individual in our, in our history. There's, of course, is very well respected by Jews and non-Jews alike. But the same thing, that his life looked like he, was, he left a, 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 a great mark in the world. But really, his life was a very hard life. The individual I'm talking about is Maimonides, Rambam. Rabbi Moshe ben Maimon, who was born a very simple individual. And to some of the texts that we have, wasn't born so gifted, by the way. I mean, needless to say, when we're looking back, we attribute to a great scholar, a genius, a master in many trades. But according to the history books, he didn't, wasn't born gifted. Kind of like we mentioned that a few months ago with Rav Kanievsky, who passed away a few months ago. He wasn't the sharpest uh, pencil in the, in the box in the yeshiva. He was actually not a good student in yeshiva. What made him great that he was determined, and in later years he became a great scholar. But when he was a kid, I'm talking about Rav Kanievsky, he wasn't like a, such a bright kid. Same thing with Rambam. He was born a simple person, but nevertheless was born to a great Dayan, a Jewish a judge, a rabbi, a great rabbi in the city of Cordova, and very simple family, lived a simple life. And at that time, there was a group of people I'm not too sure how you uh, call them in English. I think in English they're called the uh, Al-Muhads. The, in Hebrew is Al-Muhadon. This is kind of equivalent to in our generation, there's a Hamas, Hezbollah, these Muslim groups. But their agenda was to convert everybody to, to become a Muslim. Okay? I think in English they're called the uh, Al-Muhads or Al-Muhads. But nevertheless, they used to go into uh, Jewish villages and say, either you convert to become Muslim or we kill you. Of course, some people did, but many fled. So uh, the father of Rambam takes the family and they run away, like many other families. For 10 years, they were going from one place to another place, no rest, living in suitcases. Can you imagine living like that? If some people don't have a place to sleep for two weeks, they go completely crazy. They were traveling from one place to another, Needless to say, there's no money in situations like this because you can't work. Finally, after 10 years, they end up in Morocco. But even in Morocco, same thing, very bad times, and they had to flee Morocco. And this is not like today, jump on a plane. This is going on a donkey and carrying your belongings. Nevertheless, at some point after Morocco, they decide it's too hard. They run to Eretz Israel. They come to Eretz Israel. And Rambam is a young guy, a boy, then becomes a young teenager. And they settle in a city called Akko. Not a long time passed, the Crusades came here to Israel. Started doing the exact same thing. You convert to Christianity or we kill you. Okay, so they continue fl running away, finding their way down in Egypt. Okay, maybe then they think they'll find some peace of quiet, peace of mind. And at this time, finally, he finds a little bit of quiet and he starts writing one of his major uh, 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 books, which is called Dayada Chazaka. 
and which is called the Mishnah Torah in, in English. And he starts writing it down, which is basically covering all the laws of the Torah. And he doesn't work at this time. His brother supports him. His brother was a merchant, goes out, not like today that you fly for two days, go for half a year on a ship, and he supported him. Unfortunately, his brother, his name was David, at some point they get a very horrible message, the ship drowned and the, fa and the brother unfortunately drowned with the ship. Now, no brother, no financial support, and everything switches. Instead of being supported by his brother, now Rambam has to support his family and his brother's family. Okay, what do you do? So he needs to start uh, uh, finding a job. Okay, so he goes and learns to be a doctor. And that takes a while, and uh, as the time goes by, he becomes a physician, and he becomes the physician of the mufti there, and so he's kind of becoming a little bit more settled, and then he starts writing the next uh, big project that he has, uh, which is called, uh, 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 known as the Moren Evochim, the, the guide to the per perplexed. Okay. In this book, the Moren Evochim, he asks a very interesting question. Would you say life is good or life is bad? Now that's after he went through all this, and I'm telling you the journey in two minutes. He went through a very hard life. And he addresses this question, says, what do you think? Do you think life is hard or life is, uh, life is good or life is hard? Okay. The interesting answer that he gives that life is depending on interpretation. Think for one second, you, whether life is good or bad, that depends on interpretation. Because it depends how you interpret the events that happens in your life. You can have a marriage, a wedding, and you can interpret that as the gr greatest uh, thing in your event in your life. I got married. Another person on the other side of town will say, that's the greatest event, was the biggest disaster happened to me. 20 years I'm in this horrible marriage, this is the, the worst thing that happened to me. So it all depends how you interpret what's going on with you. Now, what, what do you take from that? What can you uh, uh, apply that in your life? As you need to know how to interpret your life. <laughs> if you know how to interpret situations, then that will determine if life is good or life is bad. Most people, they don't interpret the right way. They look at life in a very negative way. But really, Rambam says, if you take all the good things in your life and then all the bad things in your life, put them next to each other, you'll see that you have more good things in your life. Happens to me that you quickly forget the good times and the bad times are more uh, uh, easy to remember. But really, if you put everything together, you'll see, you know, actually, yeah, there's a lot of good things in my life. And of course, of course, everything is with exceptions. Some people have an easier life, some people have a harder life. But we want to focus on the fact that life can be defined if it's good or bad. It depends how you interpret things. Which... Uh, brings us to the first question that we have about success and failure is that really the success or failure depends on the person. Right? And not uh, on the experiences that he goes through. Because an experience, he can, you can turn it to something successful and you can turn it to be a failure. It depends on you. And that's why I asked you in the beginning. If you, take take, take, if you seize opportunities, if you see an opportunity and you take it or you let it go and then it passes. So, since we clarified this issue, then today we're trying, going to try to figure out how can I interpret the difficulties and the failures in my life to be able to lift it up to be something successful and not to be something bad. So, interestingly, if we're looking again in our history, I'm talking about the Jewish history, when did we become stronger? I mean, after all, our uh, nation, our people went through uh, uh, very bad things in our history. But when did we become stronger? Only when things were bad. When things were good, then everything became, every, uh, uh, everything became loose and not focused on what we need to. When did we become united and stronger is when things were get, got bad. And unfortunately, that's when you see it. You see, he, for example, here in Israel, everybody will eat each other alive. If Chas Shalom were attacked by our enemy, suddenly everybody loves each other. Amazing unity. I wasn't alive at the time, but at the times of the wars, of the uh, Six-Day War in Yom Kippur, what I hear from everybody, the unity and the love and the caring for each other was unbelievable. So we have to uh, be attacked 
and beyond the war in order to appreciate and love each other. I told you not once and not twice the Hasidic philosophy of the concept of that we squeeze olive in order to get the, the, the oil. When do you get the best oil? And when, when the oil, olive is squeezed. Now, so unfortunately, that's how we are. That's human nature. When do you grow? When things are bad. If everything is good, you don't grow, you don't do much. So, I'll give you an example. One of the most, uh, I don't know if to say common, but one of the most dominating thing in a Jewish life, and I'm talking about an observant Jew, is that we go to shul, to a synagogue, every day, three times a day. We go in the morning, and uh, some people go in the afternoon, and then in the evening. Some connect the afternoon and the evening together. But nevertheless, every day you go to a synagogue. A day should not pass. You didn't go to synagogue. Now, if you look in the Torah, is there any mentioning of synagogues? No. It doesn't say anywhere in the Torah that they had to go to a Bet Knesset, which really a synagogue is not the right translation. Bet Knesset is the house where people gather together. Knesset, like a Knesset, everybody comes together. So you don't find that in the Torah. My Avraham Avinu didn't go to Bet Knesset. And anywhere in the Tanakh you don't find Bet Knesset. Where did this whole thing start? I'll tell you. After the destruction of the first temple, just imagine, till the first temple there wasn't such a thing as a Bet Knesset. We didn't have prayers. I mean, there was Shimon Isra at some point, but we, we didn't have Bet Shacharit, Mincha, or Bet Knesset. After the destruction of the first temple, and we were exiled out of Yerushalayim, there was a certain individual, his name is called Ezra, Ezra Sofer. He saw that the situation is very bad. Everybody's exiled from Yerushalayim in Israel. When he started bringing everybody back, back, nobody wanted to come back because they already settled in the diaspora. He had to convince everybody to start coming back. And nobody wanted to come back. Why, why, why am I going to come back? There's no Bet Amikdash. There's no uh, prosperity. Why should I come back? Kind of like now, go to any average uh, Jewish in America, in North America, come back. What do I have to come back for? I'm established here. Uh, my kids are, are getting good education. I have a business. What do I need to come back for? Same thing then. Anyways, Ezra Sofer said, okay, how am I going to get everybody together? That he started making all these new rules, which is called the Takana, that we have to pray that we have to listen to the Torah and read from the Torah. They didn't read from the Torah before that. They were reading Bet HaMikdash. They would go in Hakel. They would go and really listen to the Torah. So he made all these takanot, all these additions. So everybody will have to start following them. And when, where do you pray? Okay, so let's make the synagogue. You have to come and pray. Let's make it that you have to listen to the Torah three times a week. And he started gathering everybody together. But look what came out of such a horrible thing as the dis destruction and the dispersion and, 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 and this uh, exile is that it made us even more closer to the, to the master of the universe with more closeness with, with, through prayer and through learning and so forth. And he says, okay, we don't have better, we don't have better Migdash. So you can't come to see the ceremonies and everything. So we'll do, we'll do prayers. We'll do prayers instead of the, the sacrifices. We'll do the minyanim. We'll do everything. So you see from something so negative how if you take the opportunity, you can, uh, as they say, li life gives you lemons and make a lemon juice. Don't, uh, don't cry over spilled milk. And the same thing, by the way, if you go 400 plus years later in the destruction of the second temple, then the same thing happened with Yochanan ben Zakkai. Very briefly to tell you the story with Yochanan ben Zakkai. Of course, there was second, uh, the destruction of the second temple, disaster to the Jewish nation. Needless to say that many of the great scholars were dying or murdered or, I mean, there was different, there, different situations. He, and, and Yerushalayim was under siege. He faked his own death so they can take him out of the walls of Yerushalayim so he can go to the empire, emperor and he convinced him, take Yerushalayim. But give me the, the, the sages. Give me the Chachmei Israel. Take Yerushalayim. Do whatever you want. He already saw the destruction is coming. It's inevitable. It's going to happen. So he convinced him by telling, Tell, take Yerushalayim, destroy it. But leave me the sages. And he went to Yavne and built the, 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 the entire uh, Torah was built from Yavne. That's when the Mishnah started and the Talmud and then the oral Torah. Without that, what would we have? The temple would be destroyed, Yerushalayim would be destroyed, and we wouldn't, we wouldn't have anything. All the sages, all the Chachamim would be killed. 
So he took the opportunity. He says, okay, listen, the distraction is coming. You can't change that. But at least let me save the Torah. And from that, you see unbelievable growth that came there. Without that, we wouldn't have not the Mishnah, not the Gemara, not the entire old Torah, all the Midrashim. So well, where did that come from? From the distraction. So really, when there's a, a, a disaster or a failure or something negative happens, that's the time to rise up and start from the beginning. And in many cases, our life brings us to a place of a disaster or a place of that, okay, I'm in a dead end or a complete failure. Okay, then you don't give up. You say, okay, this is a sign that I have to regain my power, put everything back together and start a new beginning. No, 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 don't need to look back and cry on what was uh, left behind. And why is that? Because Hashem wants you to do something better and something bigger. If something this is destroyed in your life, it's because Hashem is telling you it's time to get better. You can't build over the old one. The old one has to be destroyed so the new one can come in. Here in Israel, they have this uh, new uh, system that they, I mean, Israel after all is uh, very small but growing rapidly. And in many cities in Israel, the buildings are only two floors, three floors. So they have this, uh, this uh, I don't know how you call it, um, they call it uh, Pinui Binui. They take everybody out of the old houses, they put them in some other houses for a year or two, destroy the old two story, three stories, and build 20 stories. And everybody gets new apartments, beautiful, uh, beautiful buildings, same thing. I mean, you, can't, uh, you can't build over the old, you have to destroy the old. And new beginning, okay, so you're out of your apartment for half a year, a big deal. So, really what we want to take from that is then when there's a, a destruction or some type of a, a disaster in your life, is instead of taking it in a negative way by, by saying, oh my God, what a failure, I wasn't able to succeed, why is Hashem doing it to me? Is to say, oh, you know, this is a good opportunity. Hashem is taking away the old and telling me it's time to grow. It's time to move on. It's time to, to get better. Interestingly, you know, we all know there's a custom. I'm sure you've been once or twice or 50 times to a Jewish wedding. And I'm sure you notice that at the end of the ceremony, the groom breaks a glass, right? Have you ever asked yourself why you break a glass? Now, I know now the jokes that everybody say usually at the chuppah. You know, the first time that I heard the joke, it was funny that somebody told me, why does the groom break the glass? So somebody said, well, that's the last time you're going to put your foot down in this house. So, but that works in the jokes. And I, I heard another joke, it says the groom can get ready for plates being broken by his wife. But all these are all jokes. But really, have you ever stopped to think, why? What, what's with this custom? Okay, so many people explain. This is a, a, what's called Zecher Lachurban. That even though we're in a very auspicious, happy time, we still have to remember that we're in exile and the, and the temple is destroyed. That's, that's a nice uh, way of looking at it. But... The real meaning to that is that it's not the time to focus on the separation, rather focusing on the unity. Because if you focus on the breaking of the glass, then you're focusing on the separation. Rather, you need to focus on the unity. Now, if there wouldn't be the complete opposite, then it has to have a polarity. So the custom comes to like, don't focus on the fact that we're separating the glass, it's pieces of glass. Now you need to focus just on the unity of this couple. So really every event and encounter in our life is all how you look at it. Am I focusing on the separation or am I focusing on the unity? Am I focusing on the destruction or am I focusing on the opportunity to rebuild and to get something new, a new opportunity? Now of course comes the big question. If this is the case, and a destruction or a disaster or a failure in my life really is something very positive. So why does it look bad? If it's so good, then it should look good. No? Makes sense. Hashem, I mean, what kind of a designer is in this world? If something looks bad and it's really good, then why does it should look good? So take for example, now we're in the three weeks between Yud Zayin Bet Amuz and Tisha B'Av, weeks that we mourn the destruction of the temple, commemorate the, the, the history. Now really I said it in many classes in the past, 
If you're crying for the past, then you're taking this whole three weeks wrong. The three weeks is to look forward. If I'm looking at the past, what we did, what we missed, what we could have done, that's a very bad attitude. The attitude has to be like, okay, we're already in the exile. The destruction happened. Now what am I doing to change it? Now if I'm not doing anything to change it because I'm busy crying, I didn't do anything. And at the time when I gave these classes and I explained, listen, God gives us hints that are very simple. Shem put the eyes, he placed the eyes in the front of the head to hint to you that you have to look forward. If he would want you to look back, he would put the eyes in the back. Shem says, no, always look forward. Yeah, you need to look at the past, learn from your mistakes and move on. So when you're looking now before Tisha B'Av, yeah, we are required to mourn the destruction of the temple. But how do you mourn it? By crying how bad we were or by saying, okay, let's get our act together. So, when we're looking at the destruction of our, the temple, then our sages have, you know, question: What should you think about when you see that Jerusalem is destroyed? If you live in Israel, every now and then I'm sure you visit Jerusalem. And if you live not in Israel, then for sure you come to Israel to visit Jerusalem. I don't know anybody who comes to visit Israel and doesn't go to Jerusalem. Even uh, they took Biden to Jerusalem, no? And Trump and everybody else, they go to visit the, the, the Wailing Wall. Why did they take Trump to the Wailing Wall? What does it got to do with you? But nevertheless, they take all the world leaders, they all go to, to, to the Wailing Wall, right? The superstars, uh, the singers. Which is irrelevant to what I'm talking about, but I'm just saying everybody wants to go and see Yerushalayim, okay? So our sages have a, a question. What should you think of when you're coming to Jerusalem and you're seeing that Jerusalem, that Jerusalem is destroyed? Now you might drive into Yerushalayim now and see a beautiful city, a metropolitan and, and, and things going on and construction, but that, that's not Yerushalayim. That's just another city. We're talking about the city of Yerushalayim, Ir Zion. It's destroyed. I mean, okay, we have some uh, remainings. But the reality is that Yerushalayim is destroyed. So, what would you think would be the good thing to think about? I mean, our sages said, what should we explain to the disciples? What should we explain to the students? What should we explain to people that they have to have in mind when they see the destruction of Yerushalayim? Okay, so I'll tell you a quick story from the Gemara that... In the destruction of the second temple, needless to say, Yerushalayim was destroyed. Imagine now, I don't want to compare it any, in any way, because what we see on the news is not necessarily the reality, but they're showing you a lot of news now, showing you Ukraine destroyed completely, and the buildings are destroyed, and smoke coming out of everywhere. Now, I don't know if that's the truth or not, but just for you to understand, you know, they showed it uh, 10 years ago in Syria, how all the cities are destroyed and smoke coming out of the buildings. And But imagine now, you come back to Yerushalayim after the destruction. Everything is destroyed. Can you imagine going now to uh, 80, years, 80 plus years ago to Hiroshima or Nagasaki? Everything is wiped out. Can you go imagine going back to Yerushalayim and everything is destroyed? Okay, that was a shock for many people didn't want to go back to Yerushalayim. I'm talking about then because they couldn't handle to see the destruction. And needless to say, it was great poverty. I mean, with the destruction, whoever was remained, there was no food, no jobs, no, 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 no anything. Okay. So at the time, there was a few great rabbis. And one of them was Rabbi, Rabban Gamliel, who went with his colleague Rabbi Akiva. And they went up to Romi. They went to Rome. Why? To ask for mercy. You know, they, the Romans controlled the land. They went up there as the leaders and they plead for mercy. Have mercy on us. Okay, you conquered, you destroyed, but have some uh, rachamim, some mercy. Okay, so they come to Romi and they see a metropolitan. Businesses, show business, people are dressed beautiful, restaurants, sitting in cafes, shows. They come in from a destroyed city and Bemet, fire everywhere, buildings collapse, and they're going to this beautiful city. Everything is happening. And they say to themselves, What is better now? To be a Jew, to be a non Jew. <laughs> to be a Jew, you pour in Yerushalayim when Yerushalayim is completely destroyed. And look at the non Jews, they're living in this gorgeous city. 
It's not like Rome, what you see now, that half of it is broken. Everything was... Uh, and Rome was an empire. Can you imagine how it looked? Woo. And they're kind of like talking amongst themselves. You know, it says, is it bad to be a Jew or good to be a Jew? Maybe it's good to be a non jew right now. Look at how they live there. In great prosperity, everything looks good. Of course, Rabbi Akiva and Rabban Gamliel, they didn't doubt for a second, but they were saying, if somebody comes right now, let's say an average Jew comes, it's better to be a, Jew, a Gentile right now. I need to live in poverty in Yerushalayim. Everything is destroyed. No jobs, no economy, no nothing. I'll move here to Rome. What's the big deal? So they started crying. All the sages, sages started crying. Now, and by the way, that's where Christianity was formed at the time. Why? Because all the people saw that the nation of Israel is in this, the lowest place. Poor, sick, weak, unsuccessful, completely destroyed, completely broken. So they understood from that that Hashem doesn't like the Jews anymore and He changed the Jews to a different nation. I mean, what do Christians say? They say, no, you, the Old Testament, you had it your time. But then the master of the universe was disgusted by you and he switched the nation now. Now it's not your, not your nation. It's a New Testament, a new era. That's really when Christianity was born because we were at our worst. And they figured out, okay, Hashem doesn't like you anymore. God doesn't like the Jews anymore. For whatever reason, you went against him. You failed, so he's switching you. Now we're, we're a different nation. But nevertheless, the rabbis were crying by seeing all this, and they weren't crying because they saw the destruction of Yerushalayim. That they cried about is because they understood that the, the, the situation of the nation is that they felt there's nothing to live for. The Bet HaMikdash is destroyed. Everything is destroyed. There's no hope. There's nothing to live for. So they started crying. Well, how are we, we going to build back the nation? It's kind of like, take now the, the Jewish nation after the Holocaust. Going out of the death camps. Everybody, I mean, lost completely. Scattered all over the world. How do you get, put all the nation together? How do you rebuild such a thing? So, our sages had the same thing. And they saw the destruction. They see Rome like a beautiful, uh, successful empire. Yerushalayim is a complete disaster. The people are completely broken. No hope. And of course, they understood that this is going to be almost impossible to rebuild everything. So they felt that the nation were in such a place of despair that they didn't have anything to live for. Comes Rabbi Akiva and he starts laughing. They're laughing. Yerushalayim is destroyed. The situation is bad. The, 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 the people are like hopeless. You're laughing. So Rabbi Akiva says, I am laughing because if the master of the universe is rewarding these idolaters so much, can you imagine they're rewarded? We will get in the days to come, in the future, the ones who actually serve the master of the universe. So this is a, a quick fix what they, he gives them. They're idolaters. They worship other gods and he's rewarding them. I can't even imagine what's going to be our reward in the future for the we serve the master of the universe. Okay. This is story number one. Story number two. Rabbi Akiva and Rabban Gamliel and many other of the rabbis, they come back to Yerushalayim. Okay. And like I told you, imagine like this, the footage that you see now from a drone. <laughs> the city is completely destroyed. Walls are collapsed. Fire everywhere. They come back to Yerushalayim. Okay. Through the rubbles, they go all the way to the, whole, to the old city. To, well, we call it the old city, but to the city. And they come to Kodesh HaKodeshim, where Bet HaMikdash stood. And they start seeing uh, uh, foxes coming out of where Kodesh HaKodeshim was. The Holy of Holies, where the Kohen Gadol would barely would they be able to go in there. That if Chas Shalom a wrong thought, the Kohen Gadol would die. And they're looking at the remainings of Kodesh HaKodeshim and they see foxes running on the mountain on an on, 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 on it, And they, they don't know what to do. They don't know what to cry. They, they don't know what to do. Okay, just imagine the scene. Rabbi Akiva starts laughing. Again you're laughing? 
What's going on with you? They ask him, why are you laughing? So he says, I'm laughing because there's always bad prophecies and good prophecies. And now I see that all the bad prophecies were fulfilled. So now I'm happy because all the good prophecies will be fulfilled. So I'm laughing. I'm happy. This is uh, momentary. This is nothing. And needless to say, then they answer all back to him. You, you have comforted us. You have comforted us. Now, of course, comes the question. Okay, so the bad prophecies happen and the good prophecies will happen. So the disaster is, uh, is uh, justified. The pain and the destruction is justified because in the future, the good prophecy will, will be fulfilled. Why do I have to go through holocausts? Why do we have to go through inquisitions? Why do we have to go through all these suffering? That justifies that in the future we'll get a reward or something's going to happen in the future. I don't understand the, the, how things work here. Okay, I understand. Okay. Now you take these two stories and you say, what's the difference between them? Both are right after the destruction with Rabbi Akiva. Rabbi Akiva seems to be very, <laughs> taking everything very easy, laughing and everything is good. What's the difference between the two stories? Why in the first story, they weren't so satisfied when Rabbi Akiva said, Oh, you can you imagine what reward we're going to get? That they didn't accept. They didn't understand why he's laughing. But in the second story, they, not only that they understood his approach, by the bad prophecies were fulfilled. So the good prophecies for sure will be fulfilled. To a point that he says, Rabbi Akiva Nihamtanu, you have comforted us. But why, why did they accept it in the second time? What's the difference? Here is the secret in the approach that we have to have. It is if you have optimism, then you survive. If you have no optimism, you won't survive. And the approach of Rabbi Akiva was this optimism. Okay. Okay, so it broke. We'll build again. Nothing happened. And make it imagine if he would fall to despair and then the leaders will fall to despair. What, what, would we, what would be rebuilt? So Rabbi Akiva is holding in this certain approach of being optim, optim, how do you say, optimism, being optimist. So he is able to survive. Now, this is a build from two stages, this approach. Which, of course, the first one is called emuna. You have to have belief. With no belief, you know, nothing will work in this world. And we have to understand, while I'm holding this emuna, if I don't have emuna, if I don't have belief, I'm not talking about trust right now, I have to have belief that there's a master to the universe, there's what's called adon labira, somebody's running the show. There's no mistakes here. If I don't have that, then, then this whole approach won't work. First of all, I have to have emunah. There's a master to the universe. There's a master, there's an architect to everything that's going on here. But more than that, I have to understand something, and this is where you have to pay attention, is that the failure is not only because of me. Any failure that I will experience is not only because of me. I have a partner, the master of the universe. That was his will. If it wasn't his will, it wouldn't happen. Can you imagine how this changes now everything? Whatever I failed in, wait a minute, I'm not such a schlebazel. It's not only me. Yeah, my actions too. My actions, my, my, my connection to God. But whoa, 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 whoa. There's a master to the universe, which means if there was a failure, that's his will. So the fail is not only on me. It's will. I'm, I'm part of it too. Don't uh, now throw all responsibility on God. But nevertheless, so when I have the munah that the master of the universe controls the world and everything is done according to his will, then even my failure was already predestined and that was the will of the Kadosh Baruch Hu. That's already taking a lot of load off my shoulders. It wasn't only me. I'll give you a quick, a, a quick story that it's uh, found in the Midrash. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai and his son Elazar were hiding in a cave for 13 years. When they go out of the cave, needless to say, in, in a spiritual level that we can never relate with, doesn't matter who you saw in our generation, doesn't even 
come to the toenail of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. So nevertheless, the story says Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai and his son, they walk in the streets, they go out of the cave. And I'm not talking about when they came out of the cave after 12 years, that everything that Rabbi Shimon looked at, he caught fire. Because he couldn't understand how people are not like b bowing down to the master of the universe and serving Hashem from morning to night. And then, of course, Hashem told him, you came out of the cave to destroy my world. Go back to the cave. And after a year, another year, which uh, uh, made it the 13th year, then they go out. Okay, so the story says that they're walking around uh, in, the, in the street or the market, whatever, and they see a bird hunter that hunts birds in order to sell them. And he uh, uh, created some type of... Uh, 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 how would you call it, like a hunting device, or how do you call it, uh, a trap, something like that. And they see that some of the birds, they go into the trap and they get caught, and some of the birds, somehow, they don't. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai had a very uh, high level of Ruach HaKodesh, of divine inspiration, and he saw that the birds that kind of make it, there's an announcement from the heavens it's saying kindness and mercy, whoop, and the bird was able to flee the trap. And when it said, uh, you know, punishment or severity judgment, boom, the bird would be captured and died. And that's really when Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai understood the first time that everything happens in the control and the supervision of the master of the universe. Not the hunter, not the trap. Not the bird flying this way or that way. They, he heard the heavenly voice saying, this should be died, this should be caught, this should be free. This should be caught, this should be free. So, now what I take from that is that when I failed, I wasn't failing by myself. I did my best. Like I told you, nobody opens the business with the intention of bringing it down to a complete disaster. You do everything in your life with the intention to success. It didn't work out. Wait a minute. Don't take 100% responsibility. You weren't by yourself. There's a, a partner here. There's the will of the master of the universe that affected this way or that way. That in itself is already giving many of us a lot of hope to say, you know what? I'm not that much of a failure. But the important thing to take from that, don't throw all responsibility on Hashem. So I want to share with you a quick story. I'm sure you know it, but I want to give you the interpretation. The story is when Yosef, a tzaddik, was sold by his brothers. Uh, the story says that they captured him. Just imagine the scenario. The Torah doesn't go into details. Can you imagine this poor guy, 17 years old? He comes and the brothers gather around him and, and, and tie him up and throw him to the pit. And then they take him out of the pit. And the story says that they sold him to a convoy of Ishmaelim. Oh, Arabs, uh, what we, would we call maybe in our generation. Now, a miracle happened to Yosef Atzadik there. That usually they would transport oil and uh, tar and all sorts of materials that reeked and stinked. Happened to be that that convoy, this time, was transporting perfumes. And Rashi says that Yosef HaTzadik was such a tzaddik that Hashem didn't want him to suffer from the smell, then he made sure that that convoy were transporting perfumes. <laughs> the boy is 17 years old. He just got kidnapped. You think he cares about the smell? That's the miracle you're doing to this poor kid? Save him! Make him fall out of the wagon or something. That's the miracle. Now, on the surface, when you're reading, you're like, oh, Baruch Hashem, what a miracle. That poor kid shouldn't smell the horrible smell of the oil, of the whatever it was. And Hashem made such a miracle, made him smell Paco Roban or Calvin Klein or whatever. That's a miracle. You're already doing a miracle. That's what you were able to do? Save him. I don't understand the, the, the message here. And more than that, do you really think 
that this young teenager cares about the smell? He's, he doesn't know what's happening? He was just kidnapped. He's, he's tied like this in, in, in ropes. He probably has a mask on his face. He doesn't know where he's taken. For all he knows, he can be killed next in a minute. You think he's really thinking, oh my gosh, it really doesn't smell good here. What kind of a, why is the Torah coming and telling me this whole story? So the interpretation, the explanation, really, of why the Torah is so particular to say about the miracle that I think a, be a better miracle will be just save the poor kid. The Torah is coming to tell you, listen to me, kiddo. I'm, I'm controlling the situation. It's Hashem telling Yosef, don't be upset at your brothers. I'm the architect. I'm the one who's uh, controlling everything here. Such a minor thing that the Torah makes such a big thing out of it is to let Yosef know and also the reader that Hashem is saying, I'm in control. I'm running the show here. The same way that I can control if they're going to have bad odor or perfumes. Yosef, just did you know, you're going now to the worst place in the world and you're going to go through hell. But it's my intention. My plan. I'm running the show here. Stay calm. Everything is under control. That's what Hashem is telling us. Even when we are going through disasters, Hashem is sending us the messages. We're just too occupied with the disaster to understand that Hashem is telling us that's part of the plan. Relax. It's going to be okay. I'm controlling it. It's not your misfortune. It's not your bad calculation or your bad planning or him. We tend to blame the whole world for all the misfortune that we have. Shem comes and says, eh, hello, eh, I, I designed this event. <clears throat> Rabbi Akiva says, you know, we're talking about Rabbi Akiva. Rabbi Akiva in that respect says, Hashem breaks in order to build. Hashem doesn't break something to have a disaster. When Hashem breaks something, is only to build something new. And interestingly, you know, when I told you now the story with the Gemara, I told you quickly the story. Really, how he answered them when they told him to Rabbi Akiva, why are you laughing? He didn't answer right away, oh, because the bad prophecies. He quoted a verse from the book of Micha. If you want to look it up, it's in chapter 3, verse 12. And the verse in Hebrew, I'll read it to you in English, but the verse in Hebrew says, Tzion Sadeti Charesh. Translation, Zion, which is Yerushalayim, shall be plowed as a field. Well, that's not a good thing. Zion will be plowed, it's going to be completely wiped off, destroyed. So the whole verse says, Jerusalem shall, be, shall become heaps and temple mount like a high place of a forest. So that's, that's, with that you're going to calm me down, telling me that it's going to be wiped out, Jerusalem is going to be like a field, and plowing means destroying it completely to the ground. Rabbi Akiva, when he quoted that verse, he says, you don't understand plowing seems like it's destroying the land. But the success of the planting depends on the plowing. The deeper the plowing will be, the deeper I can plant the seed, the greater it will grow. So his entire vision was, yeah, it has to be completely plowed, it has to be completely destroyed. Because the more it will be destroyed, the greater the, re the rebuilding is going to be. We have to understand that the plowing is more important than the, when the planting. No plowing, there's nothing going to grow. The, the, the soil will be hard. It's not going to be, you know, I don't know the term in English, but when you plow, you bring oxygen into the ground. You cause the growth. So Rabbi Akiva saw things in a completely different way. Now I'm going to share with you a quick story that I heard. And I think that will shed a lot of light on the approach that we want to take. So there was once an individual who his job was to go and uh, collect money to the yeshiva, to the organization, whatever there is. 
And unfortunately, in our generation, you know, they, they, some of them have a bad reputation because many don't really fundraise for the cause. They come and take money. But at the time, there was a, an honest one who went and gathered money for the, for the organizations and so forth. And he decided to go to uh, abroad and he went to like wealthy areas and he went to one place and his uh, fundraising campaign didn't go that well. So they told him, why don't you go to so-and-so's house? He's very, very wealthy. And, you know, if he would like you, he will probably give a very nice donation. Okay. He comes to this house. It looks like a, like a palace. Walks in, chandeliers everywhere, marble floor, like something out of this world. And okay, the, the man is kind and courteous and takes him into his den. Yeah, how can I help you? And while he was waiting for the man to come and uh, attend him, he noticed something very unique. In the den where he sat him down, on the wall there was like a little place, something like, kind of like, like this, like a niche with a huge menorah. Looked like from gold or from silver. I'm talking about a menorah, like a Hanukkah menorah, with eight uh, branches. Something out of the, gorgeous. And he's saying, well, okay, this is probably thousands and thousands of dollars. Interestingly, underneath this beautiful Hanukkah, he sees like a jar with a lot of uh, broken glass, pieces of broken glass. <laughs> Million dollar, uh, uh, multi-million dollar house, chandeliers everywhere, artwork, probably in millions of dollars. This Hanukkah probably is like uh, pure gold or silver and a jar with broken glass. Okay. So the guy comes, yes, how can I help you? He tells him he's coming to gather money, to collect money. He completely lost his focus about the fundraising and he told him, listen, I have to ask you something that I can't understand. I'm, 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 I'm mesmerized by this beautiful house. I'm more captured by this gorgeous Hanukkah. But what's the story with that uh, bowl full of broken glass? So the man tells him, let me tell you a story. I grew up in this city and I was a, you know, a child for an observant family and I was sent to Cheder to learn Torah. Then I grew up, then went to yeshiva. At some point, my grandfather, who was getting very old, he was very, very wealthy, had a big business, and he came and told me, listen, I'm becoming old. I'm, I see that I'm not gonna, I don't have many more years to go, and I noticed that you are the brightest one from the family. I want to teach you the business, and I want you to take over, and eventually you'll run the business, and needless to say, you support the entire family. And he says, and that's what happened. I went out of yeshiva, started learning the business. And like my grandfather uh, said, I was bright. I took upon, I learned the business very quick. And after my grandfather died, not only that I took over, the, took over the business, I made the business way, way bigger than, as you see, we became very, very wealthy. But that came with a problem. Because in the beginning, I used to wake up in the morning, go per shacharit, then go and work. And in the middle of the day, pray mincha, go back to work. At the end of the day, go pray arvit, observe Shabbat. I was an observant Jew. But you know how it is with business. Sometimes you're busy, you don't make it to mincha. There's a business uh, deal, you skip shacharit. And before you know it, mincha started uh, stopping arvit. I started, I would travel for the business, not always easy to find kosher food. Suddenly the... Kosher observance went down, and before you know it, no Torah, no Mincha, no Tfilin, no nothing. I became completely, completely non-observant. Wealthy, but non-observant at all. And then he says, one time, it was Hanukkah, and I'm going in the street, and of course, eventually I got married to a Jewish woman, but not an observant, and I lead my life like a secular Jew. So he says, one time, it was Hanukkah, and I'm going in the street, and I see a few kids gathered together, cry, and they're crying, and they look poor, their clothes are all ripped, and, they, and they, they're door, dirty, and one of them is crying and crying. So he says, comes to the kid, what's going on, what's going on? And the kid's crying and says, what am I going to tell my dad? What am I going to tell my father? What am I going to tell my father? He says, what happened? 
says, it's Hanukkah. My father gave me a little bit of money to buy olive oil to light up the menorah. That's the only money we have. And I was running and I fell down and the olive oil, the, the bottle broke. All the olive oil is on the floor. I don't have oil. What am I going to tell my father? What am I going to tell my father? What am I going to tell my father? And this, what am I going to tell my father, pierced his heart. And he was like, what am I going to tell my father? What am I going to tell my father? I grew up in yeshiva. I grew up as an observant Jew. Now I'm running a multi-million dollar company, but I know I cannot even have the time to put filin on. What am I going to tell my father? Hey! At that moment, of course, he went and bought new olive oil to the kids. Says, here, don't worry, go. Have a nice Hanukkah. Gave them some money. Needless to say, he came home completely shaken. What am I going to tell my father? I'm completely non-observant. He says, that night was the moment that changed my life. The next day, put on tefillin, started observing again the kashrut, the kosher diets, going back to shul, praying, and before I know it, I was completely back observant. So the guy tells him, okay, I, that's a very nice story, but what's with all these uh, broken glass? He says, ah, that night, I went back to the street and I gathered all the broken glass of that bottle of oil to remind me that the shattered glass was the best thing that ever happened to me. The disaster, the destruction, the, the breaking of the glass was the build, bringing me back to the, to the Torah, bringing me back to, to God. And this is here more important to me than the... Ah, sorry to tell you, he says, of course that night I went home to light the menorah. He wasn't even observant. He says, that night I went home and lit, lit up the candle. And then the next day I started putting fill in again and again, and he kept the glass underneath the menorah to signify and to remind him the, 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 the disaster, the breaking, the, the shattered glass. That's not a bad thing. It's the best thing. That's the thing that got me back, that woke me up. What am I going to tell my father? And needless to say, brought him back. And then he said a powerful line. He says, the, the remaining glass, the broken glass, can build much more than what it was originally together. Saying, in other words, broken pieces can build much more. I can make a bumper sticker out of that. Broken pieces can build much more. Saying, in other words, the master of the universe destroys because he wants to build better. I don't want to say build back better, but he wants to build back better. That's all Hashem's slogans, by the way, all these slogans that they're coming now with. But Hashem destroys because He says, no, it's time to do something better, bigger, nicer, greater. Now we have to understand how does Hashem does that. Then Hashem knows that when I'm stuck in my comfort zone, nothing's going to happen. So Hashem takes you out of your comfort zone by sh shaking you completely and you have to take, okay, Hashem wants to build back better. Hashem wants me to give an opportunity to make a change. So it comes in a shock. If you're sitting now in a $3 million house and a beautiful car in the driveway and the yacht is in the, uh, on the water, you're not going to do anything to change your life. You're fine. Everything is good. And Hashem takes away, I, I call it Hashem takes away your lollipop. It gets your attention. Why? So you have to start building. So before we conclude, I want to share with you another quick story that I, I heard, which I relate with a lot, and I think can also, you'll find a lot of uh, great wisdom. And I heard it, I overheard it, and, I, and it's, you know, that's where Hashem is telling you, you know, everything that you hear, don't be judgmental and listen very carefully. So the story goes about a certain family that uh, an observant family, of course, that had eight kids. Happened to be that all seven kids went in the path of the Torah, and the last one, the eighth kid, took a complete detour off the path of the Torah. To a point that he was so rebellious and against the Torah, that he went and he, he literally fought with the mother. The mother threw him out of the house, didn't even talk to him. It's a true story, it's not some parable. The father was broken, and he doesn't know what to do. So he goes to his rabbi. And the rabbi tells him something very, very powerful. He says, listen, 
Hashem blessed you with eight wonderful kids. All the first seven will go, went in the path of the Torah. So you and your wife kind of said, good, listen, we did great. We were able to take all of our kids in the path of the Torah. You got a little bit of uh, too much of a, not arrogant, but a little bit, uh, a, li a little bit you felt a little bit of pride. So, and uh, what was the result? That you were not praying. You know, when you want something, you pray for it. So you stop praying for your children to be observant. You stop praying for your children to love the Torah, and you kind of neglected Hashem. And you know, in the partnership between the parents, there's a third partner here. The mother, the father, and God. So don't take all the credit that your kids are observant. So Hashem made one of them go completely off, so you can remember that you need to pray to the master of the universe. You need to give him credit. You need to in involve him. Now what you're doing here is the worst thing. That kid that appears to be going off the path of the Torah, that's the kid that is bringing you to the Torah. Because now you're praying. Now you're getting your act together. Now you're not worried where, what's going to happen. And that's the kid you're pushing away. He's your good luck charm. That's the kid you really need, you need to love the most. Because he's making you now scream to Hashem. And turn to Hashem. We need help. What's going on with this kid? And you're punishing him. So the thing is that we have to see things in the right way. As I told you in the beginning, the disaster of the success is how you interpret it. Because Hashem can build anything He wants and He uses two ways. He uses success and He uses failure. You decide. I'll tell you the problem is that when you build with success, the success are very small. When you're building from failure, the success is huge. Now you decide how you want to build. Hashem says, I will help you build. I will help you grow. I will help you achieve. But you choose. You want to do it with success or you want to do it with failure. Just remember, success, if you build with success, small success. You build with failure, you'll get great success. Saying in other words, that when we're going back to the message of Rabbi Akiva, because Rabbi Akiva was the one who says, what are you all upset? I understand, it's horrible, the disaster of the, of the temple being destroyed. But why are you all upset? This is just now to rebuild. And the message that he was saying, is he was saying, in other words, because he was telling them, they were upset seeing uh, foxes running in, uh, in, in uh, where Kodesh Kodashim. Can you imagine the holiest place in the world? And they see animals running around there. Rabbi Akiva says, you don't understand? You don't see the message? Hashem is basically telling us, I'm saving it for you. You know, when the Romans conquered Yerushalayim, they wanted to build their temple in Yerushalayim, which they want to do it up until today. Never were successful. No, no, they wanted to build their Bet HaMikdash in Har Tzion. They still want to do it, by the way. The Vatican wants to build their Bet HaMikdash in Har Tzion. With sacrifices, just instead of animals, humans, and instead of sacrificing it to the Master of the Universe, sacrificing it for their gods. But they wanted to do it then. It didn't work out. Nothing worked out. Yerushalayim was destroyed for 2,000 years. Only now, when finally we return to the land of Israel, after 1900 years, suddenly it's going back and being rebuilt again. Even Ramban, who came to Israel about 800 years ago, he says, you know, all the world grew, and this little neighborhood stayed completely destroyed. Talking about Yerushalayim. Nobody was ever able to build anything in Yerushalayim. And Rabbi Kiva then said, don't you see? Hashem is telling us, I destroyed it, but I'm saving it for you. I'm saving it so there's no humans in Kodesh or Kodeshim. There's animals. They're saving it. It's for you. Saying, in other words, I'm saving it for you. Just do what you need to do. That's the message that Hashem is telling us. Get your act together. Don't you understand that I took it away because you weren't worthy? But just get your act together. Do what you need to do. I'll give it back to you. I'll tell you another quick story because we're focusing on Rabbi Akiva. There's a very famous story with him that when he became 
uh, observant. First four years, he was a Am Aretz, a very simple individual, not learned, not educated, worked as a shepherd for Kalba Savoa, who eventually married his daughter, Rachel. And then I told you last class the story how he went to Mitzrayim for, three, uh, for, for the South through three years and he didn't get paid. If you remember last class I told you. But nevertheless there's a story that when he became a, a, a little bit learned, then there's a mitzvah that if you walk on, the, on a journey in the path and you see a dead person, it's called the met mitzvah. That you have to bury the person exactly where you find the body. That's the mitzvah. Not to sh take now the body to the si city or something. Exactly where you find the body, that's where you have to bury the, the body. This is the, the halacha. It's called met mitzvah. Okay, Rabbi Akiva goes on the journey and he sees a dead body. He puts it on the wagon, he takes it all the way into the city, makes it a beautiful burial, buys a lot, buries the dead, does the whole thing, and then he comes all happy to the yeshiva. <laughs> you can't even imagine what a mitzvah I did today. Really? What did you do? He says, I carried a dead person from uh, maybe 20 kilometers. I found him on the road. I carried him all the way into the city and gave him a good burial. I did the mitzvah of met mitzvah. Tom, that's not how you do the mitzvah. You're not allowed to carry the body. That's actually a disgrace to the body. You did it completely opposite. You should have buried him on the spot. Who told you to carry the body now? All the way into the city. And oh... All the excitement made him this big. Okay. Years have passed. And uh, every time that this story would come up, he would say it quietly. One time, one of his students says, Rebbe, why are you saying it quietly? He's like, listen, I'm embarrassed. You know, I, I, I messed up. I didn't know. So his student tells him, but don't you understand that that's the day that you became a Talmid Chacham? That's the day that you became a scholar. Because that's the day you understood that you don't know nothing and you need to sit and learn. So really, that's the greatest day. That's the turning point in your career as a rabbi. Because up until this point, you thought you, you, thought you knew it. And you messed up in such a mitzvah. And the, 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 the humiliation that they were laughing at you, what did it cause you? To sit down and learn. You understood, I don't know nothing. That's embarrassing. I need to sit and learn. And you sat and learn and look what became of you. So really, we see again that some points in our life that we take as humiliating, a disaster. Oh, I wish I never did that. Really... In many of the cases, that's the turning point that changed your life completely. That caused you to change something, or to do something, or to realize, I'm doing it wrong. <laughs>